I greet you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in that Son of God, he that believeth in me, Jesus said, will never die. He said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And today we come to celebrate the life of Ed Highfield, who had eternal life dwelling within him. So therefore we can say Ed is more alive today than he's ever been. He's still existing, just not in our presence. The Word of God is always comforting and challenging, and so I'm picking several selections today just to read to us as we begin our service. 1 Peter 5, verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Colossians 3, 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. In the book of 2 Corinthians 1, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to, to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Some of you have gone through today what Sharon and this family have gone through with. I've often said I think that a person who has given up their husband or their wife or their parents or their children, their siblings or their grandchildren is the only ones that can really understand and relate to those that are now giving them up. And therefore, those of you that have given up a loved one, and you can relate to this family, I hope that you will have a heart, a hug, a kind word that you can share to bring comfort to them. And in days to come, as the scripture says, they too will use this experience in their life to bring comfort to other people. Ed Highfield passed away September 2nd, 2022, at the age of 78. He was born November 19, 1943 at Columbus, Ohio. He was an active member here at the Heritage Free Will Baptist Church, and he presently served on our church trustee board, and he also served on our yard crew. I'm going to mention that our trustees take turns locking up our building, and Ed's month was the month of September. It, I looked around Sunday, and I think there were four trustees filling his place. They just wanted to make sure it was done because Ed was always thorough in what he did. He was somewhat of a perfectionist, by the way. Most of us who knew Ed knew that he was a caring person. He loved his family, his siblings, his son, nephew, their families, and he loved Sharon. He never met a stranger. He was reliable, consistent, dedicated, and he wasn't afraid of work. And um, I thought it interesting that somebody put the toothpick in his pocket. Because it seemed like to me Ed always had a toothpick hanging out the side of his mouth. I don't know if he ate consistently or not, but he always had that toothpick. Ed's preceded in death by his parents, Herbert and Mary Highfield, siblings Barbara Wilburn, Herbert Herbert Highfield Jr., and Kenneth Highfield. Also his in-laws, Hersel and June Sayer. Ed is survived by his wife, Sharon Highfield. They were married on December 17, 1988. Survived by son Greg and Kim Highfield, special nephew Gary and Lori Highfield, stepchildren Dana Newsom and Matthew and Allie Newsom, 15 grandchildren, Austin, Alexis, Gracie, Reagan, Megan, Corey, Sierra, Erica, Lauren, Dallas, Austin, I'm going to say Shanoa, did I get it close? Thank you, Aiden, Kempton, and Jameson, and 11 great-grandchildren. His sister Beverly and Robert Perkins, sister-in-law Peggy Highfield, brother-in-law David Sayer, nieces, nephews, and other relatives, and close friends Paul and Nancy Edwards, April and B.J. Boyer, and Kevin, excuse me, Karen Widmeyer. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, thank you so much for this day, and knowing that your grace will be sufficient helps us to come to this service with our hearts moved, touched, comforted and blessed we know lord for us it's a sad day because we're saying goodbye to someone that we love 
yet those on the other side of Jordan are saying hello to someone that they've loved. And so, Father, I pray that you will comfort us with the comfort that we need and that you will provide the grace and the strength and the mercy that our hearts stand in need of today. Bless Sharon and her family. I pray, Father, that you will minister to them through this service in a very special way and that you'll be glorified and Ed will be remembered and honored in an appropriate way today. Thank you for each one that is here. I pray your blessings on all of us as we hear from the word of God today. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. We're glad to have Austin today, Ed's grandson. He's going to come and share a eulogy for us. Thank you, Pastor. Um, like Pastor said, my name is Austin Highfield. I'm the grandson of Ed. Um, today, I wanted to start off by saying good morning. I know it's not such a, a good morning physically, but spiritually, it's a beautiful morning um, with the Lord for uh, my grandpa's with him today. I also wanted to share some stories, too. Uh, Papa was always a fun flying person, very intelligent, and went all out for everything. Um, I can remember when, when I was about 10, 9, 10 years old, he, uh, he wanted to come outside with me to throw baseball. And uh, as he did, he put his glove on and he made sure that he was ready. And he smacked his glove and he was trying to get it prepared for his hand. And he said, go out about 30 feet and I want you to pitch me the ball. And I said, okay. So he got down, uh, he, he bent down and I threw the ball and I threw it a little too high. And Papa rose up because he saw that it was coming too high. He jumped up, and you would have thought he jumped three feet off the ground. It was about three inches, but he came back down from those three inches. He fell back, and he a bear rolled across the yard. I went to go help him up, and I asked him if he's okay, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. He goes on to the next one. But that's the type of person he was. Um, he never gave up, and he always made sure that that he was making everybody else happy in what he was doing as well. All right, I wanted to share a verse today. It's Isaiah 25, 8. And in Isaiah 25, 8, it says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away our tears. Today's a hard day because we have a lot of tears. Um, but one thing I want everybody to take with them after we leave this place is, is the memories that we have of my papa and uh, the memories that there are to come that we can relate to my papa as well. Um, there will be times where we look back uh, in the reflection and, and we see papa and we see what he's done and how well he's done it and just take that with you forever. I also wanted to share a couple other stories too. Two years ago I started selling campers and RVs and papa had bought an RV a few years ago, and he loved it. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've shared many camping stories. And uh, one person that he always enjoyed is actually my boss who sold him a camper. Um, my boss, Hook, he, uh, he loves peanut buster parfaits from Dairy Queen. And so every time Papa came in, he and Grandma would buy him a peanut buster parfait and bring it in for him. Um, well... <clears throat> A couple of weeks ago when we were sitting down at mom and dad's house, we were talking about him. And Hook has been gone through a little issues. And so Papa said, well, you know, next time I see him, I'm going to bring him a peanut buster parfait because I forgot to last time. So Tuesday, I fulfilled that request for Papa and I brought Hook a peanut buster parfait in remembrance of Papa because I knew they always loved each other's stories that they had for one another. In Luke 12:32. It says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And that has happened um, five days ago, six days ago, when Papa was sent to heaven, for he was given the kingdom. And he sits there beside him on his throne, probably sharing all the good stories that he had, talking about the NASCAR races that he watched just a few weeks ago. Um, sharing stories about the upcoming Ohio State football games as he loved them. Uh, one thing that he loved most about sports is the very next day after any NASCAR race, Ohio State football game, um, he would reach out to my dad and they would share and critique 
what the team could have done better, and even with the Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> he was also uh, he was also very loving, and um, and a perfectionist. He knew how to speak to everybody, and when he'd come up to you and speak to you, you felt like you knew him forever just by the way that he spoke to to one another. Um, you know, growing up, my sisters and I, his grandchildren, uh, we share so many good stories, uh, so many good holidays, so many good times hanging out with one another. Um, I even shared a uh, a story with somebody the other day of Papa. When we were younger, we'd go over for pizza days every now and again, and we'd eat pizza. And at that time, I was, uh, I was losing my teeth, and I took a bite of pizza, and I thought, wow, you know, you, you ordered some, some pretty tough pizza. Um, the crust is pretty burnt on this. And he goes, no, nah, it's, it's good pizza. Come to find out it was my tooth. I lost my tooth at Grandpa's house. And, and that's something that I'll always take with me and treasure with me just because it's moments like that that you always remember and you'll never forget. Uh, but in closing, I wanted to go ahead and pray for us as well. So if everybody would please bow their head and fold their hands. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you today and thank you for the service that has been provided for Ed Highfield. As we go throughout our day, I just would like for us to share stories to one another about their times with with Ed and how pleasant he has been throughout uh, his life and, and the things that he shared with other people, God. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us can also take a little piece of Christ Jesus with us as well today as we can find him in our hearts and, and come to him so that we can have eternal life like Papa has now. In your heavenly name I pray, amen. That was precious yes, it was. to have uh, your grandson say fine words over you. That, that was so special. And it was special the other evening when, when uh, Sharon gave me a call and asked me if I would do a song. And uh, Ed was a, Ed and Sharon both were big bluegrass fans. And uh, if, if I could have worked it out, there would have been two other guys here with me today, but they had to, they had other commitments. Uh, but uh, the song that Sharon and I chose to do today is uh, on page 693, and we're going to make it a congregational. Is what a day that will be. So I would ask you to turn to page 693, and uh, uh, let's sing this beautiful song. What a day that will be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land What a day Sickness, no pain, no more part. All is peace forever, Lord, on the happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I 
shall see And I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day Thank you, Jim. Thank you. It was a man who thought of others. Um, I think about last Friday when he had passed away, when I got to the hospital to meet his family and to pray with them. They said he had been that day to donate blood with the Red Cross. Uh, Ed always thought of others. Uh, to me, it wouldn't seem normal to see Ed walk into church on a Sunday and not have in his shirt pocket or a coat pocket a white envelope, or a check ready to give his offering. He always thought of others. Someone told me that when you die, people don't remember what you do for them. And I made the statement in response, people remember what you do for them if you do it with the right heart and the right spirit. Ed Highfield did for others with the right heart and the right spirit. And that's why you are here today. My wife, she said, Tim, please tell Sharon that I'm sorry I can't be there. My wife has to work a job today. She's a school secretary. I know there's other people that would love to be here today to be with this family and support them, but they couldn't because of their work schedules. The fact is, Ed Highfield's life has touched a lot of people. And then some of you are here because you knew Ed's family. Some of you are here because of Sharon. Some of you are here because of others in the family. You're here to support them because their lives have touched your life and made a difference. I want to share with you a story about a man's life who made a difference in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we learn about a man whose name was Abram. The Lord promised to bless Abram and make a great nation from him, and his name would be great. Most of us remember that Abram married Sarai, and God promised them a child at their old age. God made a covenant with them, and their names were actually changed to include one of the Hebrew names, Elohim, the name of God. If I understand the story correctly, Abram's name was going to be changed to Abraham, and the emphasis is placed upon the letter H in that name. And then Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, was changed to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, and the letter H was also added to her name, and it come from the name Elohim. So the letter H from God's own name was included in the names of Abram, now Abraham, and Sarai, now Sarah. And when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old, God honored his promise and Isaac, their promised son, was born. Shortly thereafter, Abraham offered his son, his only son, in obedience to the Lord's command. He took him to Mount Moriah. God said, I want you to offer him as a sacrifice unto me. And if you recall the story, Abraham no doubt had everything there that needed to make the sacrifice. He had the fire, he had the knife, he had all that he needed. And then while he was taking the knife and going to take his son's life, the Lord spoke and said, do thy son no harm. I now know that you obey me, that you trust me, that you honor me. And the Lord provided a ram in the thicket, and that became the sacrifice. It was interesting that God told Abraham that he would provide himself, capital H, speaking of God, he'd provide himself a sacrifice. And that's what happened years later when Jesus Christ gave his life for us. The Lord spared the life of Isaac because Abraham obeyed the Lord. The writer of Hebrews shares some things about this story that I think is interesting. Let me read to you from chapter 11 of Hebrews. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man... And him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. 
These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham, this great man of faith, was a sojourner. That's a person that makes trips and stays a brief time there. In modern times, we might say he was a camper. Id was a sojourner. Id was a camper. Once in a while, I noticed that they're absent from church on Sunday and then another Sunday. When they come back, I'd say, what's been going? We've been camping. He was a sojourner. He was a camper. Id was a sojourner, and he enjoyed his time at the campsite. He enjoyed his friends being there. He enjoyed time with Sharon, that they could be out there away from everything on the campsite. To him, it was worth his time to hook up the camper, pull it to the campsite, unhook it, hook the camper up, set it up, build the campfire, pull out the lawn chairs, and relax around the table. That was what he enjoyed doing. It's rather interesting, the similarities between Ed and Abraham in this text. The Apostle Paul spoke something about this, even in 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, and it relates to Ed as well. Listen to this text. It's a familiar text. I'll read it to us from the New King James translation. Listen to the text. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, that's our fleshly body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk, not by, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Let me share with you another translation from the Message Bible. For instance, we know that when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies in heaven. God made, not man handmade. And we will never have to relocate our tents again. Sometimes we can hardly wait to move, so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions around here is like a stopover in an unfurnished shack. And we're tired of it. We've, gl- we've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. That's why we live with such good cheer. You don't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. Paul said something Ed and Sharon can relate to. Setting up the camper, staying a few days, breaking camp, headed home or to another campsite. It's part of who they were. All of us have been given this tent, this tabernacle. We were born in this tent, in this tabernacle. And it lives sometimes to be a week old, month old, year old, through our teenage years, middle age, old, and then older, then elderly, and then just waiting on the change to come. You understand what I'm saying. 
We've been given this body, and our lives are just what Paul is speaking about. Our body is just like a tent. And Paul's talking about this tent being taken down and folded up and put away, and a brand new tent being prepared for us. So the word Paul uses for our earthly house of this tabernacle is a word that signifies the body as the dwelling place of the soul. Our earthly house, our body, is regarded as a tent. It's one of those things which we are, which is seen, which is temporal. Many years ago, well, I say many, it's probably been 20 years ago, I decided that I wanted to have a tent. And so I went out and I bought a big tent. I didn't ever could buy a camper, but I bought a tent. I'd like to have a camper, but most folks camp on the weekend, and this church just frowns on me being gone on Sundays. So I don't have a camper. But I, I wanted a tent, and I decided, you know, maybe I could go out on a Friday night and take my family, and we'll go camping. And so I had that tent, and I spent some pretty good money for it. And then I put it away after the next day, after I camped in it. We put it away, and something that I never thought about was I put the tent away, and it still had the moisture of the dew on it from the night before. So no matter how much money you spend for all of that material, you know the mistake that I made. It began to mold and pretty soon began to rot. And so I got the tent back out next time to use it, and I go, oh, and we decided we'd give it away to our children. That's what you do. You take those things that you give away to your children. Because I didn't want that tent like that. I was going to buy me a new one, and I've been thinking about it for 20 years, and I've never bought one since. I'm glad my children have one so I can borrow theirs. <laughs> These tents are just like that earthly tent. If you don't take care of them, they might rot earlier. And we know to take care of ourselves. But as much as we take care of ourselves and we think we're doing fine physically, we think we're doing fine and we can do all the things we want to do. And I will say, by the way, I think some of us are learning that you can't do at the age of 60 and 70 and 80 what you did at the age of 20 and 30. So these tents sort of wear out. And then all of a sudden, God says, it's time. And when it's time, we lay this tent down, it's folded up, and we develop or we receive our new tabernacle. The tabernacle is where the Lord lived. It was interesting, the words of John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States. He, he was asked the question about getting old and wearing out. And he said, I'm very well. You Thank you, sir. However, the house in which I live is growing old. The thatch is wearing thin. It trembles in every gale. And I think John Quincy Adams will soon have to move out, but he himself is very well, sir. And I guess that's the way some of us probably feel today. Solomon said those words in a very poetic way in the book of Ecclesiastes. So Paul is anticipating the day when the body, the tent, will at last be taken down for the last time. The word he uses is dissolved. It's overthrown completely. And after a while, the best made tent gives way to the assault of the sun and the snow and the rain. And in time, these bodies do the same thing. We have wear and tear. I hear people say, if I know that like I know the back of my hand, and I say, you better look at the back of your hand because it changes every once in a while. I look at my hand and I say, wow, it doesn't look like it did 50 years ago. We've all changed. We look older. And the fact is we are wearing down. Now, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just trying to be very honest with you. We're wearing down, and therefore we understand that death is going to come to all of us. It's an appointment that every man must keep, that we must die and face judgment. Job said, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower, but then he's cut down. And so we understand our life, the fact that we are going to be here for a while, and then when God said it's time, our life here will be over. You say, but preacher, I'd like to know about it. No, you don't. You just have to trust God to take care of you. So our bodies are going to be dissolved and overthrown completely. And the, the wear and the tear is going to take its toll. So in comparison in time, the strongest body surrenders to disease and decay, accidents, or old age. So Paul had some good news, though, to say about this. And he said in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So Paul is going to give, God, give us God's word about these things. And here's what he said. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
This passage we are now about to look at says something that stirs up a lot of interest because we understand we too, just like Ed, will pass away. But what happens to our bodies when we die? It seems like Paul's recent encounter with death himself made him think as to exactly what does happen to a believer at the moment of death. He no doubt knew at death the believer would go to be with Christ. He said that in Philippians chapter 1. And he also believed firmly in the bodily resurrection. When we uh, resurrect from the dead, we will have a body and it will become a new body like unto Jesus himself. Since Sharon's uncle Paul Thompson was a dear friend of mine, I've heard him say on many occasions, and it always blessed my heart, I'll just share this. He, Paul said, Pastor Paul Thompson said, when we get to heaven, we'll all be like Jesus and we'll be 33 years old. Now, I said, Pastor, you can't prove that theologically. He said, no, but you can't prove it wrong. And he's right. I can't prove him wrong. But I will say, at age 33, I felt a lot better than I do here at the age of 60-something. Fact is, we all understand that we wear out and we're not what we used to be. So we do know what connection, even though we don't know what connection there is between a natural body and a resurrection body and a spiritual body, we do know that some kind of connection exists. And we know that when this body is dissolved, we shall have a brand new body like unto the Son of God himself. So Paul supposes here that we will have a covering for the soul between our death and resurrection. And he calls that covering a house. He also calls it a robe. So Paul says about these things, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. A house is certainly something more permanent and more enduring than a tent. If I'm going to be facing a storm, I don't want to be in a tent. I want to be in a brick house. I want to be in a house that's got a solid foundation because I can know how the wind can come and just rip the tent and move the tent and tear it apart. And so I understand that I am in a tent now, but someday I shall live in a house because my new body will be as such. So putting these things together, the believer's present body is like a tent suited well enough for our present earthly pilgrimage, but something temporary and brief. It can be taken down at any moment. It's very fragile uh, at its best. But when this tent is taken down, we shall find that God has already made provision for the believer's soul to be housed in a suitable, God-made dwelling pending the resurrection and transformation of of our present body. So, today when we view the shell that Ed lived in, I see the hand that I used to shake hands with. I see the man that smiled so well. I see the man that carried on a little bit. I saw the man that was somewhat of a perfectionist. Everything had to be right. But beyond that, that will go back to the dust of the ground. But beyond that, that soul and spirit is still alive and active today because to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. You think of that. You say, but this is so sad. It's sad for you and I. But you and I could, would not want to bring Ed back to us if we could just have a glimpse into what he's doing now in heaven. You think of that. The fact, the fact that Ed is present tense right now, Friday when he passed from this earth into eternity, that last breath here, his next breath from terrestrial was breathing celestial air. He's with his Lord in heaven. So Paul said, For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So let me tie this all together, if I may. In the Old Testament, the passage said in Genesis 18, Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is what God asked. It was God himself who confronted Abraham with this question because he had just heard Sarah laughing when God told Abraham, You're going to have a child in your old age. And Sarah laughed. And God said, is there anything too hard for me to do? So my question today is this. Can't we be like Abraham, who against all hope believed in God? He had hope in God and considered not his own body, now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He trusted God to deliver him from this physical to the spiritual realm. So Paul begins with a new view of death and said, Therefore, we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. And so the other side of that, if I'm here, I'm not there. But if I'm not here, I am there because of the goodness and grace of God. A body is essential to the human life. We couldn't float around as souls and spirits. We have to have fleshly body. 
When we accept Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit immediately makes our body his temple. And so the Holy Spirit of God lives within us. So Paul said we're confident so long as we are at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord, so we must keep walking by faith and not by sight. And that's why in Hebrews 11, that great faith chapter, he said he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Because he knew that this body would lay down. He knew this body would go back to the dust of the ground. He knew this body would dissolve. And so he's looking for a new place to dwell. Now, again, I'm, I'm not a big camper, but I have watched people who camp. And it's amazing to me how they get on those computers and iPads and iPhones and they begin to Google all the campsites. Hey, we've not been here yet. We've not been there yet. We got to try this place. Oh, this is beautiful. And they begin to get their map out and they begin to locate these places and they say, we'll make our reservations and we'll go camping and we'll have a good time. I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to listen from my heart to you. Of all those beautiful places that you could go and plan to visit, you're never going to visit a place like heaven. And when you get to heaven, there's no coming back. Because it's the most beautiful land that I could even talk about, and my words can't even describe all the beauty that is there for us. The old song said how beautiful heaven must be. It's a beautiful place that we can think about and talk about, and that's exactly where it is at. So he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God, and he said, we plainly seek for a country, a better country, that's a heavenly country. That's why we believers, we understand, we get ready to die the moment we give our life to Jesus Christ. We say, God, I am now your temple, use me for your glory, but Lord, if you want to take me, I can go because I am yours. You say, I don't understand it. Don't feel bad. Paul didn't either. He simply said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then we're going to see him face to face. So all these things that we do not understand, we will understand in days to come. So our friend Ed is gone, but not forgotten. The present body will return to the dust of the ground, but someday Ed will have a brand new body like unto Jesus himself. And the reason why is because he was the temple of God himself. And he trusted Christ as his Savior, and Christ is his sure hope. I remember the day, I can't tell you the exact day, but it was in 2006 that I entered the baptistry waters just directly behind me here. And I remember Ed coming in on this side right over here. I have a picture of that. And he came into the waters, and I, I buried him in believer's baptism. He confessed Jesus Christ as his Savior, and I remember saying, Lord, in obedience to your command... I baptized Ed Highfield in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I buried him in believer's baptism, buried in the likeness of Christ, and resurrected to walk in the newness of life. And he lived that Christian life so faithfully. But now, oh, my friend, even now, we're understanding what that really took place in his life on that day. He's walking, leaping, running, jumping, mowing grass if he could in heaven. And I thank God for those great memories. Of all the forces that make for a better world, none is as powerful as hope. We believers live in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. With hope, one can think, one can work, one can dream. If you have hope, you have everything. So I encourage you to turn to the Lord in prayer and say, God, I put my hope completely in you. I know God will provide our hope. This, this thought from my heart my body's going to perish. Your body's going to perish. Ed's going to perish. But inwardly, on this side of eternity, we can be renewed day by day. Stay close to God. Live for the Lord. Work for the Lord. Labor for the Lord. Do something for Jesus. Make your life count for God. And by all means, let your life be a blessing to someone else. God has only given us so many days. We do not know when those days will end. But God has only given us so many days, so use those days for the Lord. As Moses said in that great prayer, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. May God help us to live for Jesus. May God help us to be a blessing to others. And today that's your opportunity to be a blessing one to another. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the chance and the opportunity that you've given to me to share with this precious family. Thank you for bringing Ed into our, our life. Thank you for bringing him into our church. Such a, such a laborer, such a volunteer. I, I remember coming, Lord, 
those Thursday mornings before daylight and I see Ed sitting out there in the car saying, it's time to mow the grass. <laughs> I think about how that he was always so punctual and always so uh, prepared to do something for you. Thank you for those great memories. And I know, Lord, my memories will be different than Sharon's and different than Ed's son and different than the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and different than the siblings. But, Lord, all of us have memories, and I'm so glad they're precious memories. And so I'm praying now that you'll bless those memories deeper than our heart, and may Ed always just live in our lives and in our heart. So I'm asking you to bless his memory in our lives, our hearts. Again, I pray for this family. They need your help. They need your touch. And so I'm praying for your blessings upon them. Strengthen them. Provide the grace and the mercy that they need. You've never let us down. You've never failed us. And we know, Lord, that you'll be there for us. So I pray for all of them. I pray for our church family. Many of us are still hurting today because Ed's passing is a loss to us. But Lord, I know that you'll send somebody along the way that say, hey, I'd like to help. I'd like to volunteer. And you taught for us to pray for laborers to be going out to the vineyard. And so, Lord, I believe that you'll send people in to work. Give us faithful men like Ed. Men that read the Bible and men that prayed. Men that shared their faith. Men that cared about spiritual things. I pray now, God, that you'll work within us all. Provide what we need and we will praise you. And Lord, as the family gathers today for lunch, I pray that you'll bless the food that's been prepared. I pray, Father, that you bless the time of fellowship around the table and use this time that they together can just be encouragement and a help and a blessing to one another. I pray now in Jesus' name.